Now we're in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Let's begin reading together here in Luke chapter 6 at verse 39. I'll read verses uh, 39 through um, verse 45, and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 6, beginning at verse 39, reading to verse 45. Luke writes, and he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks." Now, as we begin here at verse 39, I want you to note with me that he says, Luke says that he spoke a parable to them. And the word parable is uh, something I want to speak to you about for just a moment because that's what he's, rece- he's giving, actually, is a parable. They're receiving a parable. The parable, or the word parable, is a story. It's a story in which nature and history uh, of God's kingdom is figuratively portrayed. It's been said that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The word literally means to place one thing beside another for comparison. And what he's doing is he's giving them a parable. Now, God revealed truth to us by his creation, and he uses it to illustrate spiritual insight. In other words, God will use that which is familiar to communicate to us that which is unfamiliar. God will use stories that that take place on earth so that we can uh, connect with those things But those stories are intended to communicate to us something that we're really not familiar with yet, and that's things about heaven. And so God can use nature to communicate his ways to man as Jesus does so when he uses parables. In Psalm 19, verse 1, the Bible says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament shows his handiwork. And so you can actually use the creation of God to illustrate something heavenly, and that's what Jesus Christ is doing. It points to God, because every house is built by some man, but he who built all things is God. And so you can use the parable, you can use an earthly story to illustrate heavenly things, because we connect with earth and can understand something about heaven by doing so. So Jesus uses parables in his teaching in order that he might share insights into the kingdom of God. There are purposes in the parables, and and one thing about a parable is it's intended to both conceal as well as reveal. A parable is intended to conceal as well as reveal. Now, how do we know that? Well, in Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 13, Jesus says this. Matthew tells us, The disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In other words, a lazy listener is not going to exert any energy or any anything that is necessary to understand what Jesus says. And so, to them, it's going to be concealed because they don't really care. If it's not plain to them, they're not interested. That's why Proverbs 25, 2 says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. And so, bottom line is the same message that Jesus Christ gives for the person who is hungry Uh, that message will draw them to be satisfied in him. But the person who's not interested in the Lord and things of God, they're too lazy to think about it. They're not really interested, and thus heaven's glory is hidden from them. Interestingly enough, about a third of Jesus' recorded teachings came through parables. 
They're called mirrors and windows because we can see ourselves in them and they help us to see life through them. And they reveal truth concerning his kingdom. They illustrate doctrine and develop our understanding of spiritual things. This particular parable that we see here, verse 39, is intended to condemn religious hypocrisy and is to illustrate its eternal effect on people. This parable actually is referring to a religious group during the time of Christ called the Pharisees. You can see in Matthew chapter 15, verses 12 through 14, how his disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. And so Jesus' words offended the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were uh, jealous. They were jealous for their place and their position in the nation of Israel, small in number, powerful in influence. They did not like losing their following. And so Jesus gives a warning and is actually speaking concerning them when he speaks here in verse 39 and is also speaking concerning just simple religious hypocrisy. These Pharisees were called the blind leaders with blind followers. And uh, unfortunately, because they were living as hypocrites, uh, hypocrites generally will lead others, but they lead them to a fall. That's why in Matthew 23, 15, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he's won, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourself. In this parable, Jesus is illustrating that spiritually blind people, the Pharisees, lead other people astray. And so if a blind man leads another blind man, neither one of them will see the pit that's in front of them. So physically, this is a picture of two men walking in a field and both falling into a hole that was dug and filled with water, a hole that was used to provide water for, uh, for animals. But spiritually, this pit that he's speaking about represents hell because that's where the spiritually blind will end up. That's why in Matthew 23, 13, Jesus said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. Uh, you neither go in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. And so Jesus is speaking here and saying, the blind, if they lead the blind, will lead them straight into destruction. Pharisees, you are religious hypocrites. As religious hypocrites, you don't see the truth. Because you have a hunger and a desire for power and position and prestige in this nation, you're not willing to hear the things that God has spoken through me, Jesus would be saying. And because of that, I have to warn people about you. Because it's as if they're walking out there in a field, and as they're walking in the field and they're blind, a blind man being led by another blind man, as they're walking through the field and they're blind, they both walk into the pit that they can't find. You have the one person who's supposedly the leader who is blind, but he's leading the other man who is blind, and so two blind men cannot see what's right in front of them. They're stumbling physically, but spiritually and eternally, they're going to be lost. And therefore, beware of the hypocrisy, beware of false teachers. And that's where Jesus is speaking about. When he goes on into verse 40, he says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So a disciple, a disciple is a learner. A disciple is somebody who is voluntarily submitted to the instruction of a mentor or a teacher. And what the disciple desires is his teacher's wisdom as well as his teacher's character. So a, a true disciple's great desire is to become like his instructor. And so Jesus would teach us that if you want to be uh, great in the kingdom of God, then you use him as the example. And Jesus various times would point himself out in that way. John 13, 15, Jesus says there, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. And so if you want to be great, if you want to be somebody who's used by God, you use the example of Jesus Christ. John told us in 1 John 2, 6, he who says he abides in him ought himself also walk, to walk just as he walked. And so we use Jesus Christ in the life that he lived as an example of uh, what we would like to aspire to, what we would like to be like. I would like to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you read the gospel, and you see his love, you see his compassion, you see his knowledge of the word of God, you see the various things that he does that he would encourage us to do, and all in you use that as your example. In Matthew 11, Jesus said it this way in verse 29. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So a disciple is not above his teacher. You never outgrow your teacher. 
A disciple, especially in areas of, of moral conduct and knowledge of the Word of God, simply has a great desire to be like his teacher. You know, I have a, a teacher in my life that in many ways, um, in many ways, I have asked the Lord to help me to one day be like, and that's my Pastor Chuck, Pastor Chuck Smith, who's been in my life um, a tremendous influence. First time I ran across my own pastor, I was 20 years old, and, and he was 43. He was 43 years old. He's about to celebrate his 80th birthday. So, but the first time I ran across Pastor Chuck, he had, he had some hair. <laughs> and I can still remember him uh, when I was 20, and I, I remember looking at him like he was just that old man up there talking to us because he was 43 years old. He was the age of my father. And I can remember as I would uh, be seated there at Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa back in 1970. I first encountered him in 1970 and sat under him as a Christian in, in uh, January of 71. I can still remember as I went there to Calvary Chapel, that small chapel there that they used to have before they had the tent and before they built the, the church that they, they now occupy. They used to have a small church that they uh, occupied there, and I can still remember going there, and I can remember sitting there as a young man on the ground and, and, and listening to the Bible studies with uh, hundreds of other kids who were 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, and uh, I can still remember looking up there and seeing this man speak to us and you know, like I said, I thought he was kind of an old guy and all, but he, he sure knew a lot about God. Well, you know, 37 years, almost 37 years later, you know, all those years of following the Lord and serving the Lord and teaching and all have only caused me in my own heart to say, I would like to have that kind of ministry as I grow older. And I spoke to him on one occasion, and, and uh, I, I said to him, you know, actually he had brought it up. We were talking about retirement, and this is when he was going to turn 65. So it was 15 years ago. And I remember talking to him one time, and, uh, and I said, so Chuck, you're looking to retire? And he said, well, yeah, I'm thinking about it, you know, and all because he had announced it at a pastor's conference, and we were speaking a little bit uh, at, at breakfast. And I said, so you're thinking of retiring? And he goes, well, I'm considering it. And so 10 years later or more, I was talking to him. I said, Chuck, you were supposed to retire about 10, 11 years ago. What happened? He says, well, you know, one of the things I've discovered that is that in ministry, the older you get as you serve the Lord, the more you have to offer other people. He said the world declares that you should retire at 65, but in ministry, you're just starting. He said, and so, no, the Lord has given me strength and desire, and I want to continue until he takes me home. And I suspect that this is going to be a man who's going to be an example of one who continues on in ministry and until one day, like Jerry Falwell recently, we'll just hear that Pastor Chuck is not dead, he's just gone home. And I think that something like that may very well happen in him. And so, he's been a great example to me. I, I want to be a minister like that. I was talking just today to one of our staff guys, Mike Callahan, and I said, you know, you know I'm not too far away from, from uh, what people call retirement. Nine more years and I'm 65. You know, actually, uh, in eight, eight years, well, nine years in one month or two, you know, I'll be 65 years old. I said, but you know what, and I just, I, I couldn't see myself retiring. I said, I'm looking at Pastor Chuck as an example. I said, and, 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 and I, I think that I'm probably going to just continue on until nobody comes to church anymore, you know, to hear me. I'll have at least one person. That'll be Marie. She has to, has to come. <laughs> but I know she won't give uh, any offerings, and so we'll have to stop, you know. <laughs> but, you know, when, when you think about it, a disciple is not above his teacher. He never outgrows the teacher if the teacher continues growing. He never outgrows them. And so the best thing that a disciple could, could have in his heart or her heart is a desire to be like that mentor, that teacher, that one that they're attached to over a lifetime to learn the ways of God through. And, and so Jesus is making it very clear there that we ought to live a life that is like his. Verses 41 and 42, continuing, why, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Now, when he says speck, and when he speaks of a plank, that word speck is a Greek word that means a twig or a splinter, and that word plank is a beam that was used to support the roof of a building. It's like... I see something in you, and so I walk up to you, and I say, excuse me, 
let me remove that problem from your life. And I begin to reach over, but I've got this two by four that's in my head and I'm slamming everybody around as I'm walking up to you. That's the picture that Jesus is giving here. Slam, slam, slam. Let me get to you and bang, bang, I'm hitting you with my. And the funny thing about this is he's speaking about self-righteous judgment because self-righteous judgment, when I think I'm better than you, well, that self-righteous judgment ultimately boomerangs. I ultimately will pay a price. It comes back to me. There's an interesting scripture. I memorized it many years ago. It's Romans chapter 14, verse 4. And, and, and the question is asked, who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him to stand. Who are you to judge another man's uh, servant? Who are you? He said, God is able to make him stand, and to his own master he's accountable. You know, the bottom line is, is that God hasn't called us to be uh, gospel Gestapos running around trying to make sure everybody does exactly what we think they're supposed to do in order to be actually serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So in matters of just normal everyday affairs, we do have a responsibility to, to concern ourselves for one another, absolutely. I do have a responsibility to care about you. There's no doubt about that. Even when Cain was being spoken to by God concerning his brother, he asked the question, am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer to that question was absolutely. Of course you are. Yes, you have the responsibility to care for your brother. What kind of question is that? Yes, you do. Of course you do. You are your brother's keeper, but you are not your brother's judge. Now, my brother has, if he has some problems, well, the first thing I better do is look at my own soul. The first thing I ought to do is look at my own heart. Who am I to bring a word of correction to you if I'm not doing right myself? You know, when I was a young man, and, and boy, that was a while ago, when I was a young man, and we used to uh, uh, talk concerning not trusting anybody over the age of 30 and all and the establishment that we were in opposition to and, and this and that. Um, we, we basically wanted to live lives that were free of people monitoring us. But at the same time, I, I came to realize that, that if somebody actually does love me, they're going to be concerned for me, but they're not going to approach me with a self-righteous, judgmental way. All of us, at least one time in our life as believers, have probably experienced it where somebody has brought a word to us of correction that perhaps wasn't done in the right spirit. And though the word may have been true, their attitude put us off so much that we didn't even want to hear what they were saying. You know, there's a couple things I've learned uh, about that. One, as I tried to do my best, to hear what's being said regardless of how it's being packaged because what's being said may very well be true. And even if the person is saying it in a way that is hurtful or perhaps prideful or mean-spirited, uh, what I have to do is I have to take that to the Lord and say, uh, Lord, two things I'd like to ask of you. One, is it true? A and two, would you kill them for me in Jesus' name? I mean, you know, I've learned to pray with great faith in that way. But the bottom line is, is it true? Because if it is true, I ask, Lord, that you would work in my life so that I can correct this. But I have found that if somebody brings a word of correction with a spirit of gentleness and meekness, that I am more, more prone to listen to what they have to say. And that's biblical. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 says, Brothers, if someone is caught in sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. You know, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You watch over your own self. You know, we provoke one another to love and good works. We consider one another and provoke one another to love and good works, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 10. And we do have a responsibility to do that. But we're provoking one another, encouraging one another to love and to a life that reflects that. And I've discovered that if you cling to the Lord Jesus Christ... If you hold fast to him and love him, your life is going to change simply because you're with him, spending time with him, clinging tightly to him. And so self-righteous judgment, when I'm looking at somebody and I'm thinking, oh, they shouldn't do this and they should do that, self-righteous judgment is something that will always boomerang. It's been said, it is a vital moment of truth when a man discovers that what he condemns most vehemently in others is that to which he himself is prone. And I think that that's true. Uh, our sins never look so bad 
as when we see them being practiced by somebody else. And so it's important for us to first consider ourselves. And then if we need to bring a word of correction, we do so in love. Jesus isn't saying that we are not to bring encouragement and exhortation to brothers and sisters in the Lord who may need that. What he is saying is don't be self-righteous and don't be placing yourself above them as if you don't stumble and fall yourself because that's pride and therefore God will not bless us for that. If I correct in love and I consider myself, I'm really flowing with the Spirit. Verse 43, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. And so Jesus is still speaking of blind guides and is still speaking concerning the fruit of their efforts. In other, in other words, hypocritical teachers who actually bring you into error. And so he's basically saying, you're going to know the false teacher by their fruit. Now, fruit trees are intended to produce fruit that can be eaten and to sustain life. And the reason for its existence is for the well-being of others. So we ask the question, can thorn bushes produce figs and can brambles produce grapes? Now, a fruit tree is judged by what it produces, not how it looks. And so the one who is speaking for God is to be, is to be um, judged, if you will, discerned uh, by his life as well as his, as his words. Does that person have fruit? Does that person have an evidence that, that he's got a relationship with God? Does that person bring me close to the Lord when they speak? Now, if somebody comes and shares with me and says, look, it, I've got a word from the Lord for you, or I've got a Bible study I'd like you to be part of, or whatever, and if I sit under that, do I walk away from that saying, I know more about the Lord than I did before. And, and as I've gotten to see this person in action, uh, I've seen that this person is uh, sincere. This person actually is trying to do what he is saying. You know, it's a difficult thing, by the way, to be consistent. I have to admit and confess that to you openly. When our church was very, very young, maybe two, maybe three years old, um, I had somebody who had come and visited the church and all and began to attend for a short time and, and approached me and said to me, listen, I've got a sister who needs uh, some help. Could you give her a call? And, and I said, well, give me her number and I'll, I'll try and call her up. And, um, and it was one of those things that I allowed myself to get overwhelmed by other things that I was doing. And, and I put that phone number on the side of my desk and I didn't call her for a while. And and then one day, it was like within a week, no more than a week and a few days, I, I made the call to her to see if I could talk to her and connect with her and couldn't get through to her. And I put the phone number on the side of the desk and didn't try again. And he approaches me and says to me, did you call my sister? You didn't call her, did you? And I said, I did, but I wasn't able to connect with her. And he got so mad and so hurt with me and, and said, well, you said that you would connect with her and you didn't do it. And I remember very well, you know, how he was hurt by that. And and, and it was at that point when I began to realize, uh, I apologized, of course, to him. I said, I'm so sorry. I did try to make the call. I wasn't able to connect. I'm sorry. I should have continued to do so until I connected and forgive me. But he was so hurt and angry at me, he left the church. And I didn't see him for years. And then we were in Ontario at that time. Then we moved over here, and it was in the early 90s. And he came walking up to me after a church service, and he looks at me, and he says, I remember you. I was invited to come to this church here. Uh, you know, and but I remember you. And I looked at him, and I remembered him too. And I said, and I remember you. Well, nice lecture that you gave today. But in essence was saying, but I know you're still a hypocrite because you don't do the things that you say. And you want to know something? I learned some pretty, pretty strong lessons through that experience. And, and that's why sometimes people after service will approach me and will say to me, Pastor, can you do this? And that's why I'll be upfront and honest with you, and I'll say, no, I can't. I want to be honest with you. Some people can't handle that. Some can. Some can't and some can. I had a lady approach me 20-some years ago now after a Bible study, and she said, Pastor, will you go out for dinner with my husband and me? And I said, no. And she says, well, we want to get to know you. And I said, you won't like me when you get to know me. 
But if you'd like to get to know me, come to church. I talk an awful lot, and you'll get to know all kinds of things about me. And, uh, you know, and I thought, oh, Lord, let's see what happens. She's going to get hurt feelings, I'm sure. But, you know, they've become very dear friends of ours over the years, and their kids are like our own kids now. But she was willing to hear that from me. And, uh, and I learned a long time ago, just be honest. Because people can normally handle an honest rejection than an attempt to pretend that I'd like to call but won't. They can normally accept that, and that's why I'm that way with you. And some of you know that. Some of you have approached me after a service and said, can you do this? And I'll smile at you, and I'll say, no. No, but thank you for the invitation. I do appreciate it. I really do, but I can't. But there are people here who have been brought on staff who can do that for you, and that's the reason they're on staff. And, and uh, if you'd like, I can make every arrangement for you to have them meet with you or to do whatever is necessary, but I'm afraid that I can't do that because I realized a long time ago that you just have to be honest and real with people, and most people can accept that. Some can't, but most can. And sometimes they'll say, well, I'm going to leave this church, and I'll say, well, bless God, you know. There are some nice churches all over the place, and I'm sure you'll find one that'll meet your needs. And, um, you know, that's just the truth. And so I think what we really need to do is we need to try and live a life that is consistent with our words. And that's what, that's what Jesus is teaching here. He's saying, listen, if you've got somebody who's teaching you something, does he try to live up to what he's teaching? His words and his works have to match. They have to match. Uh, in, in Matthew chapter 15, verses 7 through 9, Jesus said this. He said, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So any person speaking God's message will evidence good fruit in attitude and action. And that's because they're abiding in Jesus Christ and producing evidences of salvation. Romans 6.22 says, Now having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. Now no matter how healthy the tree appears, if it is unhealthy, it can only produce bad fruit. And so Jesus is simply saying, you need discernment. You need to know how to discern what is true and what is error. And so we have methodologies in which we can do that. One is uh, we have the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And the Holy Spirit can give to you within your heart a sense of this doesn't sense right. I, I really believe there's a discernment, and you find it in 1 Corinthians 12, that there's a discernment, a gift of discernment that God gives to you. And even new believers can be protected by the working of the Holy Spirit within them. And I've had that happen in my own life. I remember I wasn't a, I wasn't a Christian more than just a few weeks, you know, at the most. And, and uh, I was at my parents' home. I was still living there at that time. And there was a knock on the door. And, and I was a long hair and all. And, and I remember walking up to the door and opening the door to two Jehovah's Witnesses who were standing there. And I was wearing a Japanese robe and I had long hair and granny glasses and bushy sideburns and I was barefooted. And, and I'm looking at these two women and they got kind of scared when they saw me, I have to confess. And so I said, hi, how can I help you? I was a brand new Christian, how can I help you? And they said, well, we're, you know, Jehovah's Christian witnesses, and we're out here going through the neighborhood sharing about Jesus Christ. I didn't know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses other than my grandmother was a Jehovah's Witness, but I never spoke to her concerning what she believed in all of that. I was a brand new Christian. I made an assumption that they must believe in the same God I did. I didn't know whether they did or didn't. I assumed that. And I remember them speaking to me, and as they began to share, and I'm a brand new Christian, maybe a month or so old in the Lord, knew very little. I just started going to Bible study, just started reading the Bible. But as they were speaking to me, I remember smiling at them with that big old dopey Jesus people grin that we used to have, you know, just a freak looking at them with this big old smile, yeah. And as I was looking at her, I said, you know what? I don't think I agree with what you're saying. But you know what? That's cool. And they didn't know what to do. I, I didn't know how to, to tell them what I did believe. I just knew that what they were saying was wrong. And later on, as a, as a Christian, later on, I started reading their material. I started seeing some of the things that they believed. I, I, I bought a book called Kingdom of the Cults by Walter Martin, and I read the 110 pages or so on, on Jehovah's Witnesses. And I said, well, they believe this and they believe that. I didn't know that. This is all new to me. But the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit had put a check in my spirit. There's something wrong with what they're saying. 
And so you have the Holy Spirit who does it. First Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21 says, Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Now, how do you test that? You test that through the Word of God. You test it through God's Word. Does it line up with Scripture? And, and one of the things I know, and we've just begun speaking about this in 1 Timothy. I was sharing uh, this with you just this uh, Sunday, those who were with us this Sunday morning. I was saying one of the things you can see concerning fruit is, is how is it lived out in that person's life? And, and in, in 1 Timothy 1, 5, uh, Paul had said, the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and from sincere faith. These are evidences. There's a love about them. There's a loving spirit, and they've got a purity in their life, and they've got a love and freedom in Jesus Christ. And so you can see that. And, and so he's saying, listen, there are those who are blind leaders of the blind. Don't follow their ways. Look at their fruit. Again, we're not judges, but we are fruit inspectors, and we can check out the fruit. And notice verse 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil, for out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. This is one of the most basic principles you find in Scripture. What you are inside will be revealed by the way you speak. The heart, when he speaks concerning the good treasure of the heart, the heart represents the center of a person's will and thought life. It is also the expression of a person's character. And so that which fills your heart will overflow through your speech. He speaks about the good treasure. That word treasure is where we get the word thesaurus from. It's a treasury or receptacle in which valuables are kept. And so your heart is a storehouse, and it holds or contains your thoughts, your ambitions, your loves, your attitudes, and your loyalties. And what you value ultimately comes out in what you say. So be careful uh, that you speak that which is true, that which is glorifying to God. Let no unprofitable word uh, come out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edification, that you may minister grace to the hearer, Paul said in Ephesians 4, and that's how it works. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. And so Jesus is just making it very clear. Listen, a good person is going to say good things that are true concerning God. An evil person is going to distort those things because out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. I've seen that to be true in many ways. Uh, I have had people approach me and share with me and say things to me uh, that they... They, you know, they know my, my wife's name and they'll know my kids' names and they know that I have a grandson and all of that. And, and they'll walk up. I mean, I've had strangers approach me and talk to me, uh, people that I don't know by face, and they'll, they'll say, um, I know you by your voice. Uh, I'll give you an example. Just this last, uh, last week, um, Marie and I, on Saturday, my wife and I uh, took my daughter, Anna, out for, uh, and Joseph, my son Joseph, out for... Uh, for a late lunch, and we went to a local restaurant, and, and while we were there, we were just sitting at the table, and our server comes up and introduces himself and says, hello, and gives us his name, and so I looked at him, and I said, hello, how are you? And he, he looks at me, and he smiles, and he goes, are you, are you Pastor David? And I smiled at him, and I said, does that mean I get a free meal? No, I said, um... <laughs> I said, I, I said, yes, I am. He says, you know, I listen to you on the radio, and I can tell by your voice. And it just, tr it trips me out that people, do you know, oh, boy, I could go into story after story with this. It is just so amazing how this happens, you know. But he says, I, I, I heard your voice. I hear your voice. And they can talk to me about things. And so I said, well, this is my son, Joseph, and this is my daughter, Anna, because he's obviously heard their name because I have spoken it out in, uh, in my Bible studies. I give my kids names out. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, if we're having a simple conversation, an unguarded one, Meaning, if I were speaking to someone who didn't know I was a pastor, I can tell you within 15 minutes what they are excited about in life. I can tell you that just by what comes out of their mouth, just the things that they say. I can tell you that. I, 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 have, I was test driving a car, and as I'm test driving the car, and this was, you know, a couple of years ago, about a year ago, it was for my son Joseph. We were actually with Joseph, and I was sitting in the front seat, and Joseph is in the back, and, and the, the guy who's selling the car is driving to get us off the lot. And as we're driving, 
Um, he's just using profanity, just you know, speaking and all of that. And as he's cussing, uh, I'm just smiling at him, you know, because I've heard, I've used worse words than he was using, you know. So, so I'm smiling at him, and he says, "Oh, by the way, uh, what do you do?" I said, "I'm a pastor. I, I pastor just down the street." <laughs> Man, all of a sudden, his oh, I go to Calvary Chapel too. I said, oh, "Really? <laughs> Not mine, baby. <laughs> Not mine." But as we're you go to Rawls, I know. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, within five minutes, and then all of a sudden, you know, he's got sanctified, you know, speech. You know, all of a sudden, he's, well, praise the Lord, you know, I just love God. You know, sure you do, sure you do, you know. Of course you do. Within five minutes, you can pick up what, what really causes a person um, joy in his life. It doesn't take that long to get to know somebody. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And that's what Jesus is saying. And that's absolutely, of course, true. He moves on into verse 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who has heard and, and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. So as we look at this, what, what we're seeing here is Jesus is making it very clear in verse 46 that calling him Lord it's much more than just simply saying the word Lord. Notice how he says that this is one of the scriptures that has spoken my heart for many years. Now, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? The first time I heard anybody even quote that scripture, I'd read it, of course, before, but I was a freshman at Biola back in 73, and I heard a taped excerpt from uh, Pastor John MacArthur, and he, and he read the scripture, and he read it in such a way that it was easy to memorize instantly. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? What a powerful question. What a powerful question. How can you say that I am your Lord? And we don't understand that, of course. We live in a dem democratic society, republic, really. And, and we're, we're used to voicing our own opinions and all and, and saying, well, I'll obey this if I want to. I won't obey that if I don't. It's just the law, etc., etc. But if I lived during the time of Christ and, and I spoke concerning a person being my Lord, there was an awful lot more going on than me simply mouthing a word. When I called him my Lord, I was basically saying that I owed him my life and he has the power of life and death in my life. And so when Jesus asks the question, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say, why is it that it's so easy to mouth out that you think that I'm your Lord? Why do you say I'm your Lord, but obedience is not to be found in your behavior? Lordship is revealed by surrendering to him, following him, living for him. Jesus in John 14, 15 said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And that's how it's demonstrated, guys. That's how Christianity is demonstrated. We live in a time when there's quite a number of people, sad to say, who say one thing and do another, and, and it absolutely undermines the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There have been times when I have, and I, and I am ashamed to admit it, when I've, I've wished sometimes that people who profess to be Christians, sometimes the ones that I've encountered who are doing evil, even as they were witnessing, there have been times when I have thought, it would be better if you just didn't say anything than to say the things that you're saying to this person right now and living the way that you are. It would be better for you not to bring shame on the name of Jesus Christ than for you to be saying, oh, I love the Lord, but you're living in the way that you are. Clean up, clean up your life. Because when you, when you are saying, oh, I love Jesus, and, and you're out there doing exactly what the world does, you bring shame to your Father's name. And I've, 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 I've done that. You know, I don't stand as one who, who is, is guiltless in this. I've done that. And it's because I've done that the Lord has taught me uh, this one. He's taught me this one lesson. Why do you call me Lord and don't do the things that I say? Why? Why do you say that you love me when you're not obedient to me? Why do you do that? How can you do that? I mean, it would be like my wife Marie on our wedding day when, when the pastor said, will you love and honor your husband and all? And, 
and my wife saying, well, sure I will on, on Sundays and maybe once in a while on a Wednesday, but, but the rest of the week's mine to do what I want with it. Uh, I'll give him my heart and my soul and all that I am, but he can have that once a week and, and six days a week I'm going to go out with other guys. What's wrong with that? Now me, I'm one of these jealous husbands. I say, no, listen, honey, it's, it's all or nothing. I'm not going to marry you for a one hour a week relationship. <laughs> I want to have a relationship with you every day. I want to I be that one man in your life that, that consumes your thoughts. I want to be that person that, that you think of and, and, and still thrill over 30-some years later. That's who I want to be. I don't want to be a part-time person in your life where you care for me once in a while, but you like others. Now, I'm a human being, and I'm an evil one on top of that. But it makes sense to me that if I'm going to commit myself in marriage to somebody, it had better be a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day kind of relationship, or what's the point of getting married? Well, when I got saved, the Lord began to try to teach me the same lesson. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Why do you say that you love me, but the things that are difficult or perhaps will require some sacrifice on your part are the things that you say, well, I'll look at that some other time, or I must be misreading this passage here. You know, surely it can't be seen that I need to do that. No, we need to understand that lordship is revealed by surrendering, surrendered, surrendering him daily, following him, living for him on a day-to-day -day basis. And so he's speaking concerning uh, this in this parable. Now notice the two people in the parable. These two people encounter the same trials, same trials. But the difference is one house is built on a rock and the other is built on something that cannot hold it, hold the building. It's on shaky ground. One thing that, that I know about is that, uh, as believers, we're not insulated against hard times. We're not insulated against tragedies and trials. We're not immune from the pain of life. The one thing I do know is that when I'm out of control, God is in control. I know that. And I know that disciples remain faithful, especially in the hard times. The psalmist in Psalm 119, verse 71 said, It's good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. It's good for me that I have gone through the pressures and the pains of life so that I can learn that you are faithful to your promises. It's good for me that I've gone through these trials and hurts and, and the tribulations and, and the various afflictions that I've gone through because it has drawn me closer to you. And, I, and I've seen that your word, is, your word is true because you have said to me, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. I was sharing with, with my staff uh, yesterday in a staff meeting, and I said one of the things that we have to be careful in ministry is not to rescue people from situations that God has allowed them to get in so that he might teach them that he's God over all of their situations. So many times I want to bail somebody out before they learn the lesson that God wants to teach them, and sometimes I have to take my hands off and allow them to die to whatever it is so that they might live unto Jesus Christ. It's, it's like that, that woman who was with her son, and her son was a, a little guy, hadn't learned to swim yet, and uh, as he was walking, they were walking near the edge of a lake, and, and as they were walking near the edge of the lake, she, she knew this one area was shallow, and he could step in it, and it would only go up to his knees and all, and, and, and he could cool himself off, and so it was a warm summer day, and they step into the lake there, and she sits down, and she's got her feet in the water while her little boy is there, and uh, he's playing, but she didn't realize that there was a, a sinkhole there. She didn't know that, and as he was playing, he stepped into the sinkhole. She could not swim, and as he began to thrash, he began to fall away or pull away from the side there and there was no way she could reach him and she begins in panic to begin to scream because she knows that if she jumps in she's going to die along with him and she doesn't know what to do and as she begins to cry here comes a man and the man comes walking by as this boy is thrashing and, and the boy is a big, a big enough boy to cause some problems and so he stands there and the woman starts screaming and says you've got to help my son he can't swim and the man says to her nothing he just stands with his arms folded and she watches him as he doesn't move and she begins to scream to him. and she says you've got to help him he's drowning you've got to help help him. I can't swim. And he doesn't say a word until finally the, the boy begins to sink under the water and the man steps in and goes into that sinkhole, pulls the young guy out and puts him up there on the shore there and, and, and he comes to and then everything is calmed down and the woman says to him, why didn't you go in? Why did you wait? He said, as long as that kid had strength, he would have dragged me down with him and drowned both of us. He said, I could not save him until he realized, until I saw that he had no strength to save himself. 
And when I saw he had no strength to save himself, I could step in and save him. And you know what? The Lord will allow us to thrash and thrash and thrash in whatever situation we're in until we finally die and say, I can't do this. And I've discovered that. I've discovered that the Lord will step in and take care of me when I realize that I need his help. I go through trials like anybody else, but it's the afflictions that have taught me to trust in him, to hold fast to his word, to know that God is true. And that's what the Romans says, let God be true and every man a liar. God speaks the words of truth. He gave us his word, he gave us his Holy Spirit, he's given us his love and he gives us his help and support. So yes, we go through hard times, there's no doubt about that. But a true disciple, a true disciple not only hears and agrees in theory, but a true disciple hears and does. Because hearing and doing, once again, is evidence of true faith in Jesus Christ. In Luke 11, verses 27 and 28, uh, Luke writes, It happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts which nursed you. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Now, non-Christians obviously do not build their lives on the sure foundation of God's word. And because they, because they don't, when trials and storms hit, they're devastated. Jesus speaks concerning a structure that falls. And the fall, he says to us, is, is very great. It's a very great fall. Their foundation is built on human philosophy. And the philosophies of the world can't secure them. That's why the psalmist said in Psalm 56, 11, In God I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do unto me? When you put your trust in that which cannot save you, you will always end up empty. Always. So Jesus is saying a house built on the rock is a house that is built on trust in God's word. And so when attacks come, we're safe because our foundation is strong and it is deep. Believers build their lives on a strong foundation of Jesus Christ and his word. That's what the psalmist said in Psalm 119, 89, when he said, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Luke 21, 33 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. You see, in verse 49, he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth. Built on his house on the earth, and it just didn't have a foundation. Those who do not have a relationship with the Lord suffer greatly, not simply in this life, but in time to come, because ultimately they experience eternal separation, because that's what is the result of not building your life on God's Word. The fall or the ruin of that house is great. There's a song called American Dream. Some of you perhaps have heard it. I have the lyrics to it because I think it goes along with this very well. And let me read the lyrics to you. It speaks concerning building a life on something that is shaky, building a life on that which cannot last. All work, no play, may have made Jack a dull boy, but all work, no God, has left Jack with a lost soul. But he's moving on full steam. He's chasing the American dream, and he's going to give his family finer things. Not this time, son. I've no time to waste. Maybe tomorrow we'll have time to play. And then he slips into his new BMW and drives farther and farther and farther away. Because he works all day and tries to sleep at night, he says things will get better, better in time. So he works and he builds with his own two hands, and he pours all he has in a castle made with sand. But the wind and the rain are coming, crashing in. Time will tell just how long his kingdom stands, his kingdom stands. While his American dream is beginning to seem more and more like a nightmare, with every passing day, Daddy, can you come to my game? Oh, baby, please don't work late. Another wasted weekend, and they're slipping away. Because he works all day and lies awake at night. He tells them things are getting better. Just take a little more time. 
He works and builds with his own two hands, and he pours all he has in a castle made with sand. But the wind and rain are coming, crashing in. Time will tell just how long his kingdom stands. His kingdom stands. He used to say, whoever dies with the most toys wins. But if he loses his soul, what has he gained in the end? I'll take a shack on a rock over a castle in the sand. Now he works all day and cries alone at night. It's not getting any better. It looks like he's running out of time. Because he worked and he built with his own two hands and he poured all he had in a castle made with sand. But the wind and the rain are coming, crashing in. Time will tell just how long his kingdom stands. His kingdom stands. All they really wanted was you. All they really wanted was you. All they really wanted was you. You build your life on sinking sand and it crashes all around you and that's what Jesus said. He said, you build your life on that which does not last, and when the pressures come, it crashes all around you. And we can climb into our new car, or we can hide in our nice home, or we can run to that office that we find so much solace in and so much of our identity in, and we lose our family, and we lose everything that matters, and ultimately we even lose our own self. And one day we wake up and we say, I wonder how I got here. How did I get so far away? How did it begin? And how did I end up here? How did I end up doing these things? Jesus said, it's because you heard, but you did not do. It's because you called me Lord, Lord, but you would not do the things that I said. And as a result, you pay the price. May God help us not to pay the price.